in cases of motor weakness the first question that we need to address is whether it's a lower motor neuron type weakness or an upper motor neuron type weakness and this is what we do by performing the examination of motor system of a patient so let us ask danish what are the components of examination of motor system we observe the muscle bulk and look for the signs of muscle wasting and spontaneous muscle twitching we check the tone of the muscle and also check the power of various muscle groups we will assess the deep tendon reflexes and the plantar reflex and in the end we look for the coordination and the gait of the patient so on the basis of these examination findings we differentiate whether it's a lower motor neuron type weakness or upper motor neuron type weakness as you know that lower motor neurons maintain the growth of muscles by induced contractions as well as release of trophic factors that cause synthesis of proteins in the muscles so in case of a low motor neuron type weakness there is denervation atrophy so early wasting is a feature of low motor neuron type weakness on the other hand in upper motor neuron type weakness since low motor neurons are intact so wasting is not a common feature of this type of weakness except in cases of advanced disease where the patient may develop disuse atrophy in cases of low motor neuron type weakness the denervated muscles become hyperexcitable and the spontaneous discharge from a single myofibril can be detected by electromyography as fibrillations these are not visible to naked eye but spontaneous contraction of an entire motor unit which consists of about 100 to 200 myofibrils innervated by a single neuron can result in visible twitching of the muscle which is called fasciculations and these can be seen by naked eye so fibrillations which are seen on emg or fasciculations that are visible by naked eye are seen in cases of low motor neuron type weakness but not in cases of an upper motor neuron type weakness muscle tone is decreased in cases of low motor neuron type weakness and this is called hypotonia and it is increased in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness and this is called hypertonia in cases of a corticospinal tract or a pyramidal tract lien the, the the hypertonia is of a particular type it is velocity dependent it's more initially against the resistance and then suddenly decreases and this type of hypertonia is called class i type of spasticity after looking for tone we go on checking deep tendon reflexes deep tendon reflexes are diminished or may be absent in cases of lower motor neuron type weakness and they are exaggerated in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness clonus is actually a hyper exaggerated deep tendon reflex and seen in cases of upper motor neuron type weakness we also check for the plantar reflex by stroking along the lateral border of sole of foot a normal response is that big toe goes down but in cases of an upper motor neuron weakness there there is a positive babinski response which is big toe goes up and other toes fan out please keep in mind that in cases of acute upper motor neuron type weakness these classical signs of upper motor neuron weakness may not be seen and the only useful clue in these cases may be an upgoing plantar so coming back to three basic questions that we answer by localization of a neurological lien the first question was what is the lien so in cases of a motor weakness we need to identify whether it's pure motor weakness or it's mixed motor and sensory weakness what is the pattern of weakness is it upper motor neuron type or lower motor neuron type what is the distribution of weakness whether it's weakness of one limb which is called monoplegia whether it's weakness of both lower limbs called paraplegia or its weakness of one half of the body for example right upper and right lower limb called hemiplegia 
then again on the basis of the severity of weakness we can call it as paresis when there is partial weakness or pledia when there is complete paralysis. So the, the first question what is the lien addresses these components of motor weakness and then after answering this question we can move to the next question and that is where is the lien and with the concept of brief neuroanatomy in your mind then you can further localize the lien. So let us discuss various examples. You are asked to examine a male who has presented with weakness of both lower limbs and you find that there is muscle wasting, there is hypotonia, deep tendon reflexes are absent, both planters are down going. So on the basis of these examination findings, what do you think? What is the type of weakness? It is a lower motor neuron type of paraplegia. And where is the lesion? The lesion can be at the level of the lumbar spinal cord, the lumbar sacral nerve roots, lumbar plexus or the peripheral so nerve. Yes, it's lower motor neuron type paraplegia and lien, it can be a myelopathy which is a spinal cord disease and if it's a myelopathy it has to involve the lumbar segment of the spinal cord where these lower motor neurons are located. It can be radiculopathy but generally radiculopathy is asymmetrical and it's painful. There can be plexopathy which is involvement of lumbar, lumbar or lumbosacral plexus and it can be a peripheral neuropathy and one example common example is acute Guillain-Barré syndrome or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So what is the difference between neuropathy and myopathy? In cases of neuropathy the weakness is primarily it involves distal group of muscles. Myopathy generally involves muscles of proximal muscles, muscles of pectoral and hip girdle. In cases of neuropathy deep tendon reflexes are absent but in cases of myopathy generally deep tendon reflexes are preserved except in very advanced cases there may be contracture formation and then deep tendon reflexes may be absent. Another important point is that in case of mixed polyneuropathy in addition to motor weakness there would be sensory deficit as well which is not seen in cases of myopathy. So here is another patient who has presented again with weakness of both lower limbs but this time uh, there is no wasting, tone is increased, deep tendon reflexes are exaggerated and planters are upgoing. So Danish, what is the lien? Upper motor neuron type paraplegia or spastic paraplegia. And where is the lien? Since the low motor neuron supply of the lower limbs comes from the lumbar spinal cord. So in this case of the upper motor neuron lesion, the lesion has to be above the level of this lumbar spinal cord. Yes, it can be, so it's, it has to be above lumbar spinal cord which means it can be at the level of thoracic spinal cord or it, in case of upper limb weakness in, as well it can be cervical spinal cord. So if there is no weakness of upper limbs and isolated weakness of lower limb that means cervical spinal cord is intact. So it has to be somewhere between the cervical and lumbar spinal cord which is the thoracic cord. So uh, how can we further pinpoint the site of lien? We check for the sensory deficit. Topmost level of the dermatomal sensory loss will localize the lesion. Yes. And you should remember a few important dermatological landmarks. The symphysis pubis, if there is sensory loss till the level of symphysis pubis, it's T12. If it's at the level of umbilicus, it is T10. Ziffy sternum marks T6. And uh, the mammary gland or nipples mark the T4 level. So suppose in this case, Along with spastic paraplegia, there is a sharp sensory level at the level of umbilicus. This means that lien is at T10 spinal segment. But which disease presents like this? So it is um, a myelopathy and myelopathy is broadly categorized into non-compressive 
and compressive myelopathy. An example of non-compressive myelopathy is transverse myelitis and there are many causes of transverse myelitis. And compressive myelopathy results from compression of the spinal cord that can be from the outside or that can be from within. Examples of compression from outside include a number of vertebral diseases like vertebral compression fractures, vertebral metastasis, vertebral osteomyelitis, a tumor from the meninges that are compressing the uh, spinal cord, a subdural hematoma or subdural abscess and then compression can be from within for example in case of stringomyelia where there is cavity formation causing compression of different tracts in the spinal cord. And this concludes uh, the discussion of paraplegia and now we will take the examples of hemiplegia and try to localize the lien. Hemiplegia results from unilateral damage to corticospinal tract and this damage can be at the level of brain stem, internal capsule or cerebral cortex. Since corticospinal tract crosses midline, midline at the level of lower medulla, so a damage to corticospinal tract in brain stem, internal capsule or cerebral cortex will result in hemiplegia on the contralateral side. So let us take an example in which a person has right sided hemiplegia and lien can be at the level of left brain stem, left internal capsule or left cerebral cortex and we will discuss these one by one. Uh, one important point in localizing lien at the level of brain stem is to look for involvement of any cranial nerve. In case of a left medullary lien, in addition to right sided hemiplegia, there can also be a left hypoglossal weakness. And in case of hypoglossal weakness, there is deviation of tongue to the same side. And since deviation of tongue tells you about the side of the hypoglossal weakness, it is said that tongue never lies, which is perhaps the biggest lie. So if a person has left hypoglossal weakness and right sided hemiplegia, this localizes lien to the level of left medulla. In cases of left pontine liens, there, there would be right sided hemiplegia but also there will be involvement of 6th or 7th cranial nerve. So the 7th cranial nerve which is the facial nerve innervates the half side of the face. And in case of a nuclear lien, there will be lower motor neuron type facial weakness, which means complete weakness of one half of the face. There would be no sparing or wrinkling of forehead. So if you have right sided hemiplegia and left facial weakness of lower motor neuron type, this localizes lien to the left bones. In case of a midbrain lien, there is involvement of other cranial nerve. Uh, like third nerve which is oculomotor nerve. So again there would be right sided hemiplegia and left sided third nerve palsy which will result in left sided extraocular ophthalmoplegia. But in addition to these two findings there is also involvement of left corticobulbar tract and as you can recall from your knowledge of neuroanatomy that all cranial nuclei get innervation from both sides except for the facial nucleus because that is a hybrid nucleus and its lower half gets upper motor neuron supply only from the contralateral side. So this means that a left corticobulbar lesion will result in right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type in which case there would be weakness on involving lower half of the face with sparing of wrinkling of forehead. So if you get a right sided hemiplegia, right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type and a left third nerve palsy, this left third nerve palsy localizes lien to uh, midbrain. So if you, and this is called Weber syndrome. So if you look at the brainstem lesions, 
you will find that there is hemiplegia on one side and a nuclear weakness on or bulbar weakness or nuclear weakness on the other side so since the weakness has crossed the midline this type of hemiplegia is called crossed hemiplegia so whenever you come across a case of crossed hemiplegia that means the lien is in the brain stem now after considering brain stem lien's we'll now look at what happens in case of internal capsule and cerebral cortex lien's in case of a left uh, internal capsule lien there will be right sided hemiplegia and because there is also involvement of left sided cortico bulbar fibers you will also find a right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type now you have right sided hemiplegia and right sided facial weakness of upper motor neuron type now the weakness has not crossed the midline and this is called uncrossed hemiplegia in cases of internal capsule lien because there is there are a large number of fibers in small area in a limited space in cases of internal capsule lien's there is dense hemiplegia how do we differentiate internal capsule lien's from the cortical lien's we differentiate on the basis of presence of cortical dysfunction so uh, again in cases of cortical disease there will be right sided uncrossed hemiplegia that is right facial weakness of upper motor neuron type and right hemiplegia but in addition there will be some cortical dysfunction uh, as you can recall from your uh, knowledge of neuroanatomy that boca's area which is motor speech area is located in left frontal lobe in most of the individuals so it, with right sided hemiplegia if if there is involvement of broca's area as well patient will also have motor aphasia if after discussing this part we can further identify in case of cerebral cortex involvement which vascular territory is involved if you recall from brief overview of neuroanatomy that on the medial surface the pyramidal cells that innervate lower limbs are located and on the lateral surface the pyramidal cells that supply upper motor neuron supply to uh, your upper limbs is located on the lateral surface and you can also recall that medial part of the brain is supplied by anterior cerebral artery while the lateral surface of the cerebral cortex is supplied by middle cerebral artery so if there is a weakness of lower limb greater than weakness of upper limb it means it's a lien in the territory of anterior cerebral artery and if there is greater weakness in upper limb as compared to lower limb it means most likely it's in the territory of middle cerebral artery moreover because broca's area and wernick's area are located on the lateral surface so motor or sensory aphasia also point towards the involvement of middle cerebral artery so just to sum up these this discussion of hemiplegia in case of hemiplegia the first thing that you need to know is is it crossed hemiplegia or uncrossed hemiplegia crossed hemiplegia means lien is at the level of brain stem uncrossed hemiplegia means lien is above the level of brain stem so above the level of brain stem it can be internal capsule or cerebral cortex and based on cortical dysfunction we can differentiate between these two liens so the purpose of this educational video was to give you a fundamental knowledge of localization of lien it does not cover every aspect of localization of lien but with this knowledge in mind you can expand your knowledge and you can go into further details keep on watching and do give us your feedback